Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, AK, the Florida lawman here on True Crime MTN. I am here with Sarah Leonard. She's back to talk about the Brian Koberger quadruple murder case over in Idaho, near where she lives. She's in the great Northwest in Seattle, also a fellow criminology expert. She's got those fancy degrees like Koberger has or is trying to get, except she's not a quadruple murderer. Allegedly, I'm talking about Coburg or not you, Sarah. You're awesome. So, Sarah, welcome back. You know, there is an article that came out. Uh, it's actually sourced by ABC News, but uh, the Daily Mail came out with a, an article about it, which talks about an explosive new book that claims to reveal that the target of the Idaho murders was a particular victim, not just all of them, but Madison Mogan. And I'll read you from the article. Koberger, 29, was not on a random killing spree, but intended to target only Madison Mogan when he entered the Moscow house in November 2022, according to journalist Howard Blum's upcoming book, When the Night Comes Falling, a requiem for the Idaho student murders. Blum told ABC News that officials believe Koberger was after Mogan because he passed the rooms of two surviving roommates before startling the, starting the killing spree that shocked the nation. Quote, if he was just on a killing spree, it would have been natural, instinctive to go to one of those doors, Blum said. Instead, he goes up this narrow staircase and he turns directly into Maddie's room. And I think Maddie was his target. And the uh, story goes on to say uh, that Blum also writes of Koberger's family members being concerned about his behavior leading up to his arrest. Koberger's father, Michael, was supposedly on edge when he picked the alleged killer up from school after the murders. Michael has been reading the headlines. He knows that four students were killed 12 miles from his son's house. He knows what a troubled son he has, Blum said. Blum claims that one of Koberger's own two sisters approached Michael to voice suspicions about her brother, but the father ignored her. Quote, he can't confront it, Blum told ABC News of the father's reaction at the time. And uh, furthermore, meanwhile, sources told both Blum and ABC News that the two surviving roommates, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, were using their cell phones to communicate during and after the murders. As DailyMail.com previously reported, Mortensen, 21, allegedly called out to her friends and roommates during the, the early morning hours of November 13th to quiet down. Quote, calm down, you're being loud, she reportedly yelled around 4 a.m. In addition to, I'm trying to sleep. The college student then closed and locked her door. After hearing more loud noises that night, Mortensen opened her door again and saw Koberger, but believed him to be a party goer. Now that's where I have an issue with all this because according to reports, Koberger was wearing a mask. So how do you believe someone's a party goer when they're walking by you dressed in all black and a mask? So I don't know about that last tidbit. Uh, Mortensen told law enforcement she had seen a strange figure dressed in black walking pass her towards the back exit of the house just after 4 a.m. on the night of the murders. So that is the latest. It is a controversial uh, book for some of the reasons I mentioned, but it is getting a lot of attention. Sarah, what's your take on that? I was surprised when I saw this book come out because I thought that there's a lot of evidence that, the, that Blum must be using that maybe we haven't seen as the public. Um, it's interesting when you think about the circumstantial evidence pointing towards him targeting Maddie, because indeed what he says is that he went past the first floor bedroom, he went past the second floor bedroom and went into the back bedrooms. Now we heard right after this, this, these murders took place that Kaylee Goncal, his father was saying that Kaylee had been complaining of a stalker. It never really became clear in the media whether that was corroborated or we had evidence for that. But we know at least one of the girls was claiming and complaining to have had a stalker, which is interesting because when we talked about the cell phone evidence, we could see that Koberger had been around or near the house at least 12 times prior to the murders. Now, if he was stalking them, he probably also was, you know, watching them from the front, but probably also watching them from the back. And if you look at the floor plan of the house, and if you looked at the photos of the house before they tore it down, you can see that one of those top floor bedrooms actually had a balcony and a huge sliding glass door. And the balcony was not accessible from the ground. You could only access the balcony through one of the girls' rooms. 
And so if he was stalking them and he was sitting out there back on that hill behind those trees watching them and he had one of them in mind, he would have known that both Maddie and Kaylee's bedrooms were in fact in the back of the house, which could have caused him to pass by those front rooms. It, it is interesting. So based on what you know about the, the house itself, which has now been torn down, do you think that this was likely then that this, that Blum has it right, that he actually passed up the other rooms to target Maddie Mogan? I, I think it's plausible. I think possibly with the first floor bedroom that Bethany Funk was on, I think possibly if she was, they had said that she was in there sleeping at an earlier time. I think like she got home at around 1 a.m. And so it's possible that he might've passed by that door not knowing it was a bedroom because it would sometimes be weird to have that bedroom on, on the first floor where it was because it was the only bedroom on the first floor. But the fact that he passed, he went up the stairs, he passed by Dylan Mortens's room, which is in fact, you know, where they found a, a footprint right in front of her room and then went into Zana's room first. So I think it's interesting. Blum said he went to Maddie's room first because that would have implied he went all the way to the third floor, killed Kaylee and Maddie who were in the same bed and then came downstairs and killed Ethan and Zana who were on the second floor. What I read was that he went up to the second floor, going into the room that he thought was Maddie's room, realized it wasn't, killed Xana and Ethan, and then went up to the third floor to find either um, uh, Maddie or Kaylee. So, of course, we don't know what path he took, but I think that the, the path where he went into the second floor, realized he was in the wrong place, and then went up to the third floor is probably the more plausible path. Because looking from the outside of the house, you can't necessarily tell that it's three stories. So he knew they were in the back of the house, but maybe he didn't realize there was three floors. You know, it's, it's really interesting because that would answer my question. And then why would he kill anyone else in the house? If he was just targeting Maddie Mogan and because she was on the third floor. Um, why stop on the second floor unless he went into the wrong bedroom? And so that's what you're thinking here. I think that does make sense. Um, so uh, good point, Sarah. And what do you think about the uh, allegation that the family had an inkling that Brian Kohlberger was perhaps the person who did this. The father didn't want to talk about it, the sister. Uh, and the sisters have been apparently fired from their jobs uh, because their last name is Kohlberger. They're related to this guy. So uh, they also seem to have paid a price for this. Brian Kohlberger was a heroin addict. So when Blum's book alleges that the father sort of had an inkling that, oh, my troubled son is only a few miles away. He's a criminology expert. He loves serial killers and you know murder and death and now there's this mass murder just miles away from where he is a student yeah i could see that being plausible that the father would uh be worried and then come get him right I'd drive across the country and then drive across the country again to drive him back to pennsylvania uh you think that also makes sense sir I mean, it could. I mean, if he was in fact stalking Maddie and I, and I had heard and read somewhere that he was, you know, DMing her on Instagram and that he, they had possibly seen, he had possibly seen her out and about at the bars. If she had been rejecting him, it's possible that he was complaining to his dad, like, oh, I'm pursuing this girl. She doesn't like me. And perhaps his frustration was escalating and escalating and escalating. And so perhaps his father knew, you know, that he had been struggling with girls. We know that he was kicked out of bars, asked to leave bars because he was making, female employees and female patrons feel uncomfortable. And so it'd be interesting to know how much did he actually disclose to his father that's going to cause his father to be worried about him. Now, if he, if you think about someone committing a quadruple murder, maybe he only had intended on killing one person. Maybe he was getting a rush from killing four people. I can't imagine that he was in a normal state of mind after he did that. So I think the father could have been worried about him for multiple reasons. Well, if he was bent on killing everyone, he left two uh, potential victims there alive in, in the house. He walked right by one. Apparently, they locked eyes, and he just walked out. So I don't know if he was in a trance or whatnot, but that is another one of the questions in the case. Now, you mentioned this motive that he was stalking Maddie. He was interested in these girls. He was rejected, perhaps, but that's not a speculation, right? There is nothing conclusive that we know that the motive is the fact that he allegedly was uh, stalking them on Instagram or in person, right? I mean, there's nothing that's out there that establishes that as the motive, because I do think that is one of the big questions of this case. What is the motive here other than trying to, you know, get his jollies as a, as a serial killer, as someone who studies the, uh, the mass murders? 
I mean, one thing that I did see in the news recently, and this is, of course, you know, not direct evidence, but that one of the family members was working on either a foundation for like social media safety for young women. And so that would indicate possibly that that family knew something that was happening on social media and wanted girl, you know, wants girls to understand how to be safer on social media. Of course, that's just reaching. We obviously don't know, but these, this is some of the evidence that I'm really looking forward to coming out in the trial is what was in the girl's DMs on Instagram. Was he in there? Can they tell on Instagram that he was stalking their profile? That I'm really interested to hear. Right. So we don't have any conclusive evidence. We haven't seen that yet, that mm -hmm. that's what he was doing. But that's a lot of the speculation that's out there. Uh, and uh, you mentioned an interesting point about the father perhaps getting that information from his son. You know, there's, there's no father-son privilege like there is a husband-wife privilege. So in a spousal relationship, you do get a privilege. You can't be forced to testify against the other. But when it comes to hus uh, father-son, that privilege doesn't exist. So the father could be subpoenaed to testify. Of course, he could try to lie or take the fifth, but that could be coming if prosecutors believe that he's got relevant evidence. We saw this, in fact, in a case we were following on this channel in Fort Myers, that Wade Wilson case. His father was a key witness against him, said that, yeah, he confessed to the crimes to me. So it is possible that the father, I guess, could take the stand, but this father seems to be a lot more protective of his son than Wade Wilson's father was. Well, and it'll come down to what we see in the text messages, right? Because if his if he was texting his father, oh, I did something bad, I've been having these urges, these girls are rejecting me. And if, you know, we can see those texts, those are admissible to court. So that'll be interesting too. Maybe he won't even have to testify if there's something in those messages. Yeah, possibly. Or to uh, validate the message, you know, you've got to authenticate these messages so that they're just not hearsay. So that's, he may be forced to, to testify because I'll tell you this right now, one guarantee I've got for this trial, Ryan Koberger ain't testifying himself. So that's not happening. But yeah, there are ways to authenticate these text messages where you don't necessarily need the, the party to it, but it is helpful if the person who received the text message could, could uh, testify to it under oath. But either way, I still think this case is, uh, uh, is strong. I think that there needs to be a trial date sooner than later. We're going to get that hopefully soon. But justice delayed is justice denied. I feel for the families. And hopefully this will get kickstarted soon. I want to thank you, Sarah Leonard, for being with me today. That's Sarah Leonard. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman here on True Crime MTN. We're going to continue following the Brian Kohlberger quadruple murder case. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe, and leave a comment below. We love reading your comments. Even if you want to defend Brian Koberger in this, go ahead, leave your comment, and we'll see you next time.